Well, good morning. Thank you, Orchestra, for starting us this morning. I'd like to welcome you to Calvary Church. My name is Cheryl Knoll, and I'm on the worship staff here at Calvary. I have the girls' ensemble here with me this, this morning to help us lead in worship. And we're going to be focusing on the Lord's love and faithfulness to us as we sing. Um, Psalm 100 invites us to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Would you please join us and stand and sing together? Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Bo Eckert, the senior pastor here at the church, and it's great to see everyone here, whether it's here in the auditorium, whether you're listening by radio, whether you're watching over the internet. We're so thankful that you've decided to come and to be a part of our service this morning here at Calvary Church. And I know that there are people here in the room at Calvary this morning that are here for the very first time And we want to warmly welcome you. Thank you for coming. Uh, Thanks for being a part of what we're doing here at Calvary Church. And we know that Calvary is a big church, but we have an environment uh, that we've designed and created with you in mind, and we call it our welcome gathering. And it takes place right after this service ends in the east end of our lobby, which is to your left and to my right. Uh, There's a room over there by the east entrance. There's a big sign out front that says welcome gathering. And this is a place for you to get questions answered and for you to get oriented to Calvary Church. Uh, We'll take no more than 10 minutes of your time. There'll be some staff there. I will be there. I would love to be able to meet you and connect with you personally, answer any questions that you have about Calvary Church. So we hope that you would take a few minutes at the end of the service to connect with us at the welcome gathering. Now for all of us, as we introduced last week, uh, 
in your bulletin is an insert about the Thanksgiving offering. Uh, many of you that have been a part of Calvary Church for many years, you know the tradition of the Thanksgiving offering to be able to have a, a time of year where we give above and beyond our, our regular uh, gifts and offerings to be able to support some many diverse projects, some here in Lancaster, some all around the globe. Uh, so this uh, insert that's in the bulletin is designed to help to orient you to that. For those that are newer to Calvary Church and aren't familiar with this offering, would love for you to be able to participate, and you can start giving to this Thanksgiving offering at any time. doesn't have to just be on Thanksgiving Day, but any time uh, from now into December, you can do that. You can mark that uh, online with your online giving. You can mark it in your check. Uh, there's a special offering envelope uh, in, the, in the box of envelopes, if you use that, uh, that you can use. One thing I want to make clear about this. This page lists all the different um, uh, opportunities and projects that we're supporting through the offering, but when you give towards the offering, you're just giving you know, to the Thanksgiving offering. You don't have to designate to the, to the individual projects. We'll cover all those prog uh, projects with the one offering uh, that we're taking, the one Thanksgiving offering. So uh, you can start to give to that uh, at, at any time, uh, and we're looking forward to see the way that the Lord will provide uh, to support uh, these different projects. Now, many of you know, if you've been here to Calvary Church, that every Sunday when you come, it's a little bit different. You know that the music's a little bit different. Um, my preaching can be a little bit uh, different from week to week. Uh, and, and it's never kind of the same template. And this morning is true of that. This morning is one of those unique uh, Sunday mornings that, that, that I love here at Calvary Church because it's a way that a big church feels more like a family because there's going to be a lot of personal things that are going to take place. We're going to celebrate uh, new physical birth through child dedication. I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. We're going to celebrate new spiritual birth as we're going to see some testimony, hear some testimonies and see uh, some folks get baptized. Uh, we're going to honor our veterans for, for, for Veterans Day that's coming up uh, and we're going to be as always going to open up God's Word together, uh, and we're going to get after it as we get into to the Scripture together. So we have a wonderful morning planned. Uh, we trust that you'll be encouraged uh, and excited and inspired by what's going to take place here at Calvary Church this morning. So um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the things that we're going to do today is child dedication. So there are uh, four families that are going to come and join me up here on the platform right now. And let me tell you a little bit about child dedication as they are coming. Child dedication is not equivalent to child baptism. This is more about the, the dedication and the commitment that the families are making, uh, and, and not really so much about the, the, the child. It kind of fits that prayer that, that Hannah prayed for, for, for her son when she said, I'm, I'm dedicating, I'm committing him uh, to the Lord. And uh, these families have gone through our child dedication class, which is not so much about orienting to them to what happens today, but helping them to understand what it looks like to be a part of uh, children's ministry and to be a part of, to be a young family here at Calvary Church. And so during that class, they've talked about parenting with the end in mind, not just kind of thinking about what do I need to do right now, but what does it look like as I have the, the stewardship of raising this child? And they've also talked about uh, taking everyday moments to train and to, to parent and to raise their, their, their child. And uh, they've talked about how modeling and being a testimony to their child starts with their personal and their individual relationship uh, with God. So you guys have talked about that in your class. There's some uh, specific things that you've learned, sp sp specific things that you've uh, committed to. And I just want to ask you here publicly of, of the things that I just mentioned, the things that you talked about. Is that what you guys are committing and dedicating yourselves to here today at Calvary Church? Great. And as we all, as the congregation, as their larger extended family, we want to be able to come around these families. We want to be able to be, able to be a part of, uh, of raising their children. And for those of you that were here, you remember a couple weeks ago when I challenged us, if we truly want to be an intergenerational church, we need all of us. And these young families need all of us to come around and support and be a part of what's, the, what, what's happening as we live out our vision and value. So uh, now's the time I'm going to ask each of these families to step forward. They've written a prayer that I'm going to pray for their child uh, as a part of the commitment and the dedication that they're making today. Uh, so first, Sylvan, Sylvan and Carolyn are coming and they're bringing little Simon. Hey, bud, can I hold you? You're not so sure, but let's try. Can I hold you? You got a big smile on your face. We see you up there on the screen. Let's pray together. 
Father, would you grow in Simon a desire to love you with all his heart, soul, and might? Empower Sylvan and Carolyn by your spirit to model that kind of love to him in, our own, in their own lives. Guard his heart and draw him to Jesus as his personal Savior, Lord, and very life. Make him a blessing to others, and may he bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you, Simon. Next, Brian and Carrie Lynn are bringing little Chase. Hey, bud, I like your hat up there in the screen. You look great. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day of dedication. I pray that Brian and Carrie Lynn will be parents that raise Chase in unity and in a godly home. I pray that he will come to know you at an early age and that he may grow in his relationship with you and become a godly man for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, buddy. God bless you guys. Thank you. Next, Matt and Jennifer are bringing little Lauren Grace. Hi, sweetie. Can I hold you? Can we try? No, she's not interested. I have, I have four girls at my house. So I can, no, okay. We're not going to push it. We're not going to push it. We're not going to push it. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for Lauren, a precious gift. Would you please give Matt and Jennifer your guidance and direction? Help their words and their actions and their decisions to point Lauren to you. Throughout her life, give her the courage to stand boldly for righteousness and wisdom to humbly seek your will. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, sweetie. And finally, Nicholas and Jessica are bringing little Lucas. Hey, bud, can I hold you? Let's try. Come on. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> Lord, we pray you would guide and bless Lucas in everything that he does, that he would grow up loving and following you as his personal savior. I pray you would give Nicholas and Jessica the wisdom to raise Lucas in the way that you would have him go and use them as examples to show him what a life of obedience to you looks like. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Can we as a congregation just show them our love and support? You guys can, you guys can head down. <clears throat> Man, it's exciting to see that. I know it can be a little bit humbling and daunting for these, children, for these parents to think about uh, the, the, what they're committing themselves to and dedicating, uh, but we as a church want to be able to come and to support them uh, in all that they're doing. So um, this morning, as we've talked about, there's diversity in the, the music and our time together, uh, singing each and every week, and we're privileged to have some of our teenage girls lead us this morning. So we're going to continue to worship together, so I want to invite you to stand now and let's sing together.
That truth about God's faithfulness is not just words that we sing and they're not just words on the pages of our Bible, but those, that truth of his faithfulness, we see it being lived out in the lives of individual people. And we have the opportunity now to hear testimonies and see some folks be baptized. And this is one of the most encouraging things that happens in the life of the church because we're seeing truth lived out in people's lives. So you're going to hear a testimony. You're going to hear their testimony by, by, through the video screens, and then you're going to see them uh, here live in front of us to be baptized. And uh, some people of different ages, but listen for the uniqueness in each of the stories and listen to the way God brings about his transforming work in lives. Let's look to the screens together. I knew what to become a Christian, but I, don't, I didn't really like put my trust in God because I was so afraid every night. I also got upset very easily. I decided I would um, follow him and I wrote a prayer on November 15, 2012. I wrote a prayer that said, I want God to be in my heart every day and I want to follow him. We're going through James for the church. It says um, you have to, you can't just hear it hear, or read the word, but you have to put it into practice and do it and live it out. And that was important because I sometimes just read it and put my Bible down and walk out for school. But what I should do is I should read it, learn it, go to school, and do it. I should do it at home too. And it's actually kind of like harder at home. My favorite verse is Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I like that verse because I get to inherit the, I get to inherit the free gift. on the basis of your personal testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ. I'm so delighted to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. I like building, and I like taking things apart, and then learning how they work, and then putting it back together. I don't know what day it was, but we were having a little camp out in my mom's room. My sister asked her, my mom, a question of what a Christian was and what it is to be a Christian. And my mom told me about us, about God and um, Jesus and how what, what, what he did for us. And we had a prayer and that's when I became a Christian. He helps me to be like a lot more generous and like when someone asks me to do something not say why or no of course not Philippians 4 8 through 9 finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are good of good report if there's any virtue and if there is any praiseworthy, med meditate on these things. I want to be baptized because God commands us to, and I would feel like I'm obeying Him. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Truly I say to you, unless you are born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Ten and a half years ago, I had the privilege as a doctor to deliver Gavin into this world with a first birth, the birth of water. And today I'm privileged to be part of his second birth. And, and um, I have seen Gavin, part of the second birth, as we saw today up front here, we brought Gavin up here when he was a little baby and had him dedicated Amen. in front of everybody here. We as family vowed that we would uh, raise Gavin up to, to follow the Lord. And you as a church body also uh, vowed that you would see to it that he uh, was raised in Christian values. 
and we just thank the church here for taking the time through Sunday school and church and teaching him the word and being an example uh, of Christ in his life. And Gavin, uh, at four years of age, realized the right and wrongs that he had sin in his life and that he needed a savior. And I just thank the Lord that he uh, gave his life to the Lord. And I have seen the fruit of that in his life, the love that he has for people, the caring, the giving. And I am very confident that he has made that decision. And I'm proud as could be uh, to, to baptize him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I've struggled a long time with like depression and the whole abuse with my mom started when I was two and I started hurting myself. One thing that I regret about it is like I have scars and some people don't understand and they just look at you like you're different because of those scars. But I want to believe that I have these scars to show where I've come from, where Jesus brought me from and where I'm going. Julie was my preschool teacher 17 years ago. It was Palm Sunday, um, the day where like Pastor Bo had all those like cards up and everything. The things that we fought, like we believe in ourselves without Christ, you know, like abandon and all the negative feelings. And when he turned over the cards and showed us the, you know, what what you are in Christ, like how Christ views you, like it just like. I'm Kind of like a light bulb came on and he said, you know, anybody that's ready to give your life to Christ to come up. And Julie looked at me and she's like, you ready? And I was like, yeah. So I went up and gave my life to Christ that day. I used to hurt myself. I don't do that anymore. Um, I, my faith is a lot greater. Um, like I look to God instead of like looking to my self-harm as a way out. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but through the world through him might be saved. I want to be baptized today because I want to show everybody what the Lord's done for me and what I want to do for the Lord. Lashley, on the basis of your wonderful testimony, your precious sister in Christ, and, uh, and uh, it's a privilege to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There was always just this huge void in my heart and I was always trying to um, somehow satisfy that void with different things, whether it be with partying or um, with trying to control how I looked. Um, I had an eating disorder that not many people know about, but um, I wanted to, to look good and I wanted to really look perfect and that was just another thing that I could control. I felt this tug on my heart to seek after God and do the right thing. One day I was walking out of the cafeteria and I saw this table for the Christian fellowship and I just completely dodged it. Like I didn't want anything to do with it. They had a fall conference and I guess the leaders were praying for me to go. So I went and um, it, was, it was amazing. The pastor that actually ended up marrying my husband and I. Um, he was um, giving a talk um, about Hosea and about how um, God told Hosea to marry a woman who was an adulterer and how that um, really reflects the way that we are to God because we're constantly seeking these other things in our lives to fulfill this, this void in our heart. 
I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Like, that's crazy. How does God love me when I do all of this stuff that's just terrible? And then it became so clear to me that it's because of Jesus that that is possible. I didn't pray any sort of prayer. I didn't know I was supposed to. I just felt like a completely new person. This one girl whose name is Danielle too, she was a leader in the fellowship and she, it turned out she was in all of my classes and she also had suffered from an eating disorder and she just really took me under her wing and discipled me and, and taught me about Jesus, you know, despite all of my sin. When God looks at me, he doesn't see that sin, he sees the blood of Christ. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I want to be baptized because I love Jesus and I want everyone to know. Well, amen, Danielle. What a powerful testimony of God's grace and love in your life. And uh, on the basis of that, it's my delight to be able to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I never lose the wonder of God's powerful working in the lives of people. And we've just heard some amazing stories of his grace and his love. We're going to transition now, and as we receive our morning offering, the girls ensemble are going to come back, and they're going to sing a song of God's power, that he is able and that he never fails.
Amen. <clears throat> well, amen, girls. Thank you so much uh, for leading us. And Dave is right. Those stories, those testimonies, um, to, to, it, it's one thing as I'm about to do, you know, to, to talk through truth from Scripture, but when you see the reality of it in people's lives, it's just so encouraging. Now, before we jump into to our, our passage today from the book of Titus, Tuesday is Veterans Day, and so we want to take a moment now just to honor and recognize our veterans. And before I do that, let me, let me just say a quick word to all of us. Um, we know that there are some of you that wish that Calvary Church would do more when it comes to politics in our country and patriotism, and there are some that think that we should do less than we do. Let me help you to understand the tension that we try to manage in this area. Scripture is very clear that we're citizens of heaven first and that we should be Christians first and then citizens of whatever country we live in next. This is Christ's church. He is the head of this church, and it's very much a global church. We have brothers and sisters all over the planet. We have global partners serving all over the planet. We have a Chinese church that meets here. We have a Ukrainian church that meets here. We translate our service into Spanish and it's a global church. It's not an American church. But at the same time, this is the other side of the tension. We are located, this church is located here in America. And we're thankful for the freedom that we have in this country to come and to gather and to freely worship. So it's okay and appropriate for us to honor those that are serving and have served to secure and to maintain that freedom. So that's why we do what we do on a day like today. And to help me do that and to make it even more specific, would love to be able to bring all of those that are serving and all those veterans up here. But uh, I'm gonna ask Bob Metzger to come and to join me up here on the platform. Bob is part of our staff. He works part-time in our staff, uh, helping to take care of the facility. And uh, Bob just recently had back surgery. You made it up here nice, so you seem to recovering, recovering nicely. But uh, Bob, tell us um, what branch of the military you served and when you served our country. I served in the uh, United States Air Force uh, from 1951 to 55 uh, during the Korean War. Then I served as a B-29 tail gunner. And I appreciate greatly to represent all the veterans today. Yeah. Well, as Bob uh, represents uh, the veterans that are here with us, we would like to, uh, those that are currently serving or those that have served as veterans to stand now so that the rest of us uh, can thank you and recognize you for your service. So go ahead and stand. Thank, thank you all very much. It's encouraging, huh? It is. That's great. Very encouraging. Very encouraging. Um, as we've done throughout this series, uh, before we study the passage of Scripture that we look at, we're going to have it read, and so Bob has agreed uh, to, to stay up here on the platform with me and to read our passage of Scripture for us this morning. So, Bob? Okay. It's also a privilege to read God's Word and uh, a letter from Paul to Titus, chapter 2, verse 15 through... Chapter 3, verse 8. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. 
But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Great. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's pray together. Father, we've seen new life this morning, both physically and spiritually. We've sung, we've prayed, we've honored the veterans. And now as we come to your word, would you allow us to be changed by it, be challenged by it, convicted by it, because we want your word to do its work in our lives. We need it. So would you allow it to do what you want it to do for us now? In Jesus' name, amen. We are nearing the completion of our series entitled Unfinished. Some of you said, is there a point that this series will be finished? Not today, but next week. The reason that this series has been called Unfinished, we're looking at Paul's letter to Titus, is because Paul told Titus to put what remained into order. To take the things that are unfinished and undone and to set them right. And so we've called it unfinished because there's an aspect in all of our lives, no matter who we are, that we feel that tension of being unfinished. Relationships, jobs, projects around the house, even spiritually. And so how do we live in a life that feels unfinished and live in a world that's certainly unfinished? How do we live in that tension? And Paul's letter to Titus helps us to do that. So I want to encourage you to turn with me to Titus chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 15. It's found on page 998. There should be a pew Bible in front of you or underneath uh, your pew if you want to follow along. I encourage you to do that this morning. Whether it's the Bible in front of you, whether it's an electronic version of the Bible, if you want to get out your iPhone or iPad or whatever and, and find Titus chapter 2, verse 15, we encourage you to, to do that. Because I want you to see these words. I'm going to put a few verses up here on the screen for us, but not all of them. So I want you to, to see it. I want your eyes to be able to see the words of the text and to follow along. Uh, we use the ESV version. And we start in Titus 2 verse 15, which is really one of those hinge verses that we've seen throughout this series. If you followed along in the reading of the scripture on the, that's on the back of your bulletin, you can see how there's always a verse that kind of transitions between week to week. And that, that's what we have here with verse 15. It says, declare these things. And it makes us say, well, what things, Paul? What things should we stand up and declare? What things do we need to hear and it could be the things that came before. It could be the things that come after, the things he's about to say. I think it could be both, but I think it more naturally refers to what came before. And what came before is that glorious passage that we looked at last week that talked about the grace of God appearing in our lives. And we go through the busyness and the hustle and bustle of our lives and the world that we live in and Paul is reminding Titus that the truth of Scripture needs to be declared. It needs to be spoken. It needs to be preached. It needs to be read. You and I need it in our lives because our tendency is to drift away from it. 
to drift away from this truth and live according to what we think is right and according to the desires of our own heart. So he says, declare these things, declare these truths. And sometimes when you do that, you're going to have to exhort people. That's not a word that you and I use on a regular basis, but it's a word that means to encourage. Sometimes I get the privilege of standing up front and encouraging you with Scripture. I think that happened to many of us last week if you were here. You left encouraged. But then there's other times that we need to be rebuked. We don't like that word. Kids don't like that word. Sometimes our impression and our view of church is, well, that's all they ever do. We come and you get rebuked and you get yelled at by the pastor and then he sends you on your way to try harder and then you come back next week for another dose. Well, as you saw last week, that's not always the case, but sometimes our hearts need to be challenged and we do need to be rebuked and there's an aspect of this morning's passage that will certainly do that. So as we transition now into chapter 3, if you like to take notes or at least follow along in the outline, I encourage you to open up the bulletin. I've got it outlined for you there. And in some regards, just the very outline of this morning's passage might help you to have a greater understanding of Scripture. So I encourage you to kind of have that there along with your Bible, even if you're not going to take notes. Chapter 3. Verse 1, Paul says this to Titus. He says, remind them, remind the people, remind the Christians in the church, remind the people that have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to remind them to do certain things. The very fact that he says remind them tells us this is something that they know. This is something that they've heard before. Many times, the way that you and I should live our lives, the way that you and I should treat one another, it's not rocket science. It's not as if we don't know how we should be. The challenge is having the motivation and the desire to actually do it and actually put it into practice. So Paul's saying, this isn't anything new. This isn't going to be earth-shattering, what I'm about to say. But I want you to remind them of these truths. And the truths that he's about to remind them to do is the way that we live in the world around us. Two weeks ago in chapter 2, we looked at the way that we are to live within the church. Remember that? Older men are supposed to do this. Older women, this. Younger men, younger women. That was relationships in the church. This is relationships with the world in general, with all people. And he says this. He says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authority. To be obedient. Now, what's he talking about? rulers and authorities. All of us live in a society. There's people that are over us. Government is over us. And notice that there's no qualifiers here. It doesn't say, if they live in a democracy, they should be submissive and obedient. No, it says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient to them. No qualifiers. And so often when we talk about this concept as Christians and we think about the government that we are to submit and obey, we immediately want to go to that passage in Acts where the disciples said, well, we obey God and not man. And that's certainly true. God is our first and final authority. But too quickly we want to go to that and we don't realize that Scripture does encourage us to be submissive to the rulers and to the authorities that God has placed over us. So be submissive. Be obedient. And as you do that, you should also be ready for every good work. Sometimes we think as Christians that we just should do good things in the church. 
I come and I serve at church and I'm a part of what's happening at church to contribute to the body of Christ, which is certainly true. But even with people that we might not want to serve, even with people that we would say don't necessarily deserve it, Scripture encourages us to be ready, to be looking for opportunities to do good works. Verse 2. To speak evil of no one, I put it in the positive, to be honest, to not slander. It says to speak evil of no one. It's an interesting concept for us to wrestle with coming off these midterm elections. Speaking of politics. Do you find yourself tempted to speak evil of people in politics that you might not necessarily agree with? To slander them. Paul says, no, you need to remind them to speak evil of no one. No qualifier there. To avoid quarreling. If you're filling in the blank, I put it in the positive and I said peaceable. To be people that are marked by peace. Right now, as a staff, we are working through this short little book, but powerful book called Resolving Everyday Conflict. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it in, unless you never have any conflict in your life. If you don't, then you don't have to read this. But I don't think that gets anybody off the hook. Ken Sandy is the author. This is the shortened version of the Peacemaker book, which is a fantastic book. Much longer, start with this, Resolving Everyday Conflict. And as a staff, as we've worked through it, we've traced throughout the Scripture all the different times, Old Testament and New, that talks about being at peace with other people. God likes to refer to himself as the God of peace. And because of the blood of Jesus Christ, there can be peace between us and God, but there can also be peace between one another. Avoid quarreling. Be at peace with others. Be gentle. Gentle in our actions. Gentle in our words. And to show perfect courtesy towards all people. To be considerate. It means to not be harsh. I want you to look at that verse with me up here on the screen. The ESV translates it to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Different translations translate it different, well, different ways. But the word there for courtesy is to not be harsh. The word there for perfect is to be complete and to be whole. I love the way it states that. Perfect courtesy. What would it look like for you and I to show perfect courtesy towards all people? All people. Not just Americans. Not just Republicans. Not just people that are my age. Not just people that agree with me. But to all people, including people that steal our parking spaces at Park City. <laughs> Somehow that keeps coming up in my life. I was thought of that again. I wasn't very courteous to the guy that took my parking space. There's no qualifiers. It's all people. You know why? It's all people because the grace of God has appeared to all people, bringing salvation to all people. Therefore, we should show perfect courtesy to all people. It's how we should live. Now look at this list. There's nothing there that's earth-shattering. There's nothing there that we don't know how to do. We just don't want to do it. 
Now, oftentimes, after Paul would give us a list like this of what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to live, he often grounds that and gives us the motivation of what God has done for us. And he's about to do that, but notice what he does in this passage. It's a little bit different. Before he immediately starts talking about what God has done for us as the motivation for how we should treat others, he goes and reminds us of what we used to be like. And that the very people he wants us to submit to and be obedient and be ready to do good works and be honest and peaceable and gentle, those very people, without Christ, that's what you and I are like. Look what he says, verse 3. For we ourselves, an emphatic we, including himself, including all of us, For we ourselves were once foolish, spiritually blind. We were disobedient, disobedient towards God. We were led astray, deceived. Isn't it a horrible feeling to be deceived? We were enslaved, slaves to various passions and pleasures. And as a result, we would then pass our days in malice, being malicious, and being envious. If you're filling in the blank, put the word envious in there. I pause and camp on that because it can be something that we struggle with no matter who we are. To be envious means to have ill will towards somebody else because of a perceived or actual benefit or advantage that we think that they have over us. It means that we cannot bear with the success of somebody else. So we're jealous and we're envious, and some of you know what it's like, and it can eat you up inside. And as a result, we're hated and hateful. This is who we were. This is who we are without Christ. Sometimes the longer that we follow Jesus, the easier it is to forget what would we be like without him. And some of us, we need to be reminded of that, maybe even on a daily basis. I know I do. We can get a little high and mighty in who we are and how we act and how we behave, and we forget that these words up here on the screen are true of us without God's working in our lives. Now, sometimes when there's a list in Scripture, sometimes the words are synonymous. Sometimes we make too much about the list and about the order. But the more I thought about that this week and the more I contemplated this list, I feel like maybe Paul has a progression here. So let me go through this list just one more time and see if I can convince you that there may be a progression. You see, we're fools. We're spiritually blind. We don't know how to respond to God. And therefore, since we don't, we are disobedient towards Him. And if we're disobedient towards Him, it means we are obeying self and following self and following the desires of our own hearts. And when we follow the desires of our own hearts, we're deceived and we're led astray. And when we're deceived and we're led astray, we become enslaved to the passions and desires that are there in our life. If we're living for self, then we're just following through and pursuing and seeking the desires that we want. And when that happens, life starts to crumble and fall apart. And so we have feelings and an attitude of malice and being malicious, being hateful and hostile towards others. And as we do that, we become envious of what they have, which leads to us being hated and being hateful. Malice, envy, hate, strong feelings, strong emotions that come as a result of us being disobedient, led astray fools. 
That's who we are. That's the condition of the human race without Jesus. And sometimes even if Christ is in our life and working in our life, we can still struggle with these feelings and emotions, but we've learned how to mask it, haven't we? We've learned how to cover it up. But it should be a reminder to all of us of how much we need Jesus and how much we need God in our life. Not just somebody that we prayed a prayer to to save us, but somebody that we need daily and ongoing in our lives. So I've just brought the tone in the room down to a somber place. And I'm sorry about that, but it's the reality of what the Scripture says. So Paul starts with, here's how you should act and behave, be submissive, be obedient, be ready, be kind, do all those things that he says. And then here's what's true of you, here's what you shouldn't be like. And sometimes if we're not careful, that's our view of God and that's our view of the church. To-do lists. Do this, don't do this. We close our Bibles and we feel miserable about ourselves because we can't do it. But the passage doesn't end there. Look what it says in verse 4. It says, but. But. In contrast to who you were and to how you act and to how you feel and to the attitude that you had in contrast to all of that, is God. And he doesn't start by saying, but God, which he does elsewhere in the scripture. He starts by saying, but when? And to me, that's significant. Because when God wanted to show us what he is like, what his character is like, who he is, it was a when. It was when he showed up when he appeared, when Jesus pulled on flesh to come and walk around planet earth to dwell among us and show us what the Father is like. Amen. And here's what the Father is like. Goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, aorist tense, past tense. He saved us. You and I need a savior. So here's what happens. Here's what we're going to do as we look through these verses together. I've made two columns. It's just kind of the way that it worked in my mind. If it doesn't work for you, I apologize. As I go through this passage, you're going to see on the left, characteristics of God. So I just put, but God, because it's in contrast to the way that you and I are. God is different than us. So on the left is going to be a list of words that characterize God. And on the right, it's what God did. He saved us, and there's going to be words that describe what he did in saving us. So I'm going to read through the passage and highlight for us who he is and what he did. Verse 4, but when the goodness and the loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. It tells us who God is, and as I say, I feel like I say it over and over and over again, and it's a good thing because if I'm not just reminding you, I'm reminding me, and I know I need to hear it. If I'm left on my own, my view and my image of God is not this. My view and my image of God can be God, you're not on my side. You're out to get me. No, reminded over and over and over again that God is good, that God is loving, and that God appeared. God showed up onto the scene. Sometimes we think God is so removed and so distant. No, this God pulled on flesh in Jesus Christ and came and showed up among us. Verse 5, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. Just in case we needed to be reminded of that again. He doesn't save us because of what we do and what we can offer him. 
He saves us because of his character and his nature, because he's good and because he's loving. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. He is a merciful God. And here's what that salvation looks like. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You say, okay, now you lost me. Now we get into these big churchy words. But just, just stop for a moment and think about what those words mean. When do you need to regenerate something? When it's dead. When it's old. When does something need to be renewed? When it's expired. When it's corrupted. When it's damaged. Remember the chair from last week? It's a picture of my grandmother's old, rusted lawn furniture that my aunt took, and she restored it. She regenerated it. She renewed it. That's what God does. That's what Jesus does for us when he saves us. Verse 6 whom he poured out on us richly. Part of God's character and his nature is he's a rich and generous God. When God gives, he gives abundantly. God's not skimpy. It's not, here's a little bit of grace. No, it's out of his overflow and out of the abundance he gives abundantly. He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Just a little side note, if you're looking at your text, do you see the Trinity? Do you see how in this theologically rich passage about the gospel and about what God has done for us, the Trinity is there, whom he, verse 6, the Father poured out. What did he, who did he pour out? The Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse 7. So that being justified, given a right standing with God by his grace. Not by the works that we can do, not what we can earn, but by his grace. And as a result, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs speaks to the relationship that we have, the hope of eternal life. The Christian life is about looking back at what he's done, but looking forward to eternity and what is going to be true of us for all of eternity. And it should guide and direct the way that we live in the here and now. So as we pause and as we stop and as we look at this list, it's who God is. It's what God has done for us. And there are many of you that say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you've done that and you've brought that into my life. But don't miss the force and the emphasis of this passage. Do you remember that this starts with how how God wants us to live and treat other people? And so even though we celebrate that this canon is true of us, it's also true of the people that you rub shoulders with every day of your life. That person that you really have a hard time getting along with it, that's in the cubicle right next to you. That God wants you to be, show every form of courtesy to that person. These realities are true for that person as well. So it should change the way that we think about others. So as you think about this list, then go back and look at that first list. Because in order for us to be submissive and obedient and ready for good works and honest and peaceable and gentle and considerate, we need to remember that how we treat others is grounded in what Jesus has done 
not only for you and me, but for them as well. So my challenge for us this week, a a takeaway, an application from this message is to say, who is there in my life that I have difficulty treating this way? Who's there in my life that maybe I don't have peace with? Who's there in my life that my words aren't always gentle with? Who's there in my life that I'm not as considerate as I should be? And maybe this week, just this week, because I don't want to overwhelm you, but maybe you just start this week and you wake up and you read verses 4 through 7 and say, God, thank you for who you are and for what you've done for me, but also for this person or that person or whoever they might be in your life. And say, okay, God, I can be peaceable and I can be ready to do a good work for them because of who you are and because of what you have done. Let's remember where we were and remember what's been done for us. Titus chapter 3 verse 8 brings us to one of those hinge verses that we will look at again next week as we finish off this series, but let's look at it together now. The saying is trustworthy. What saying are you talking about, Paul? I think he's talking about what we just looked at in verses 4 through 7. It could be the whole letter. It could be all of chapter 3. It could all of it be wrapped together. But he's saying the saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things. These things that you're supposed to declare. These things that you're supposed to teach. This truth about God and the way that we're supposed to treat one another. I want you to insist that these things are happening. They need to be a reality in people's lives. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. I think that's a nice little summary of what the Christian life should be like. It's there on the bottom of your outline. Believe in God and be devoted to good works. Believe in God. Believe in this God. Believe in the God that was listed and described in verses 4 through 7. Don't believe in the God that you've created in your own mind. Don't believe in the God that you've created in your own image. Believe in the God that's revealed through the pages of Scripture from the people who met and talked to Jesus. Believe in that God. And when you believe in that God, It's going to inspire you and motivate you to be devoted to good works. It's not either or, folks. It's both and. There are some people that believe in God and it doesn't make a difference in their life. It doesn't make a difference in how they live and how they treat other people. There's also people that take this and they flip it. If I do good works then God will be pleased with me. Then I can believe in that God. It's both and, and the order is essential. Believe in the God of the Bible. Believe in the character and the nature of that God and how he's presented. Understand what he has done for us and allow that belief to inspire and motivate us to do good works, to be considerate, to treat other people the way that they should be treated, the way that Scripture encourages us to treat them, whether they they deserve it or not. Believe in God. Be devoted to good works. It's not complicated, but it's really hard. It's really hard to do. Got lots to chew on this week, lots to put into practice. I hope that outline will help you as you think about these concepts and live them out. 
believing in this God and being devoted to good works. Let me pray for you. Father, it seems so clear when we read who you are, what you've done, and then how we are supposed to be and respond, how we are supposed to live out of the truth of what you're doing in our lives. But it's much easier said than done. So I pray right now for all of us, for me and for the people here listening to my voice. May we believe in you in who you are, the way that you've been revealed to us. And may that lead and motivate us to do good works, to treat others the way that we should, to to reach out, to love, to care for, to share the gospel, to do all that you've called us to do. Give us the courage, give us the strength to believe in you, and to be devoted to every good work. For your honor and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Next week, we finish up the unfinished series. Not sure how that's going to work, but we're going to try to bring it to a completion. I want to remind you of the welcome gathering that's going to take place just now out in the east end of the lobby to my right, your left. Would love to be able to connect with you there if you're new or newer to Calvary Church. I'm encouraged by all that's happening, encouraged by the life change that we've heard about today. Thank you all for being here. May God bless you as you go. Have a great day and a great week.